Disney here. Let's find out who these 26 people are, or those people who are on the crop insurance program, and let's make sure that they are working. Otherwise, we will cut their benefits. I urge my colleagues expired. to vote no on this unbelievably misguided amendment. Gentlelady's time has expired. Gentleman from Florida. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I yield to the gentleman from Washington State whose welfare rolls were reduced by over 55 percent due to the 1996 work requirement. The How much time does the gentleman State. yield? 45 seconds. The gentleman's recognized for 45 seconds. Uh, thank you. Um, Mr. Speaker, I rise in support of this amendment. Uh, my colleague was absolutely right. The unemployment rate is 7.5 percent. People do want to go back to work. This is what this bill does. It helps people go back to work. Currently, the government has 83 programs, 83, to help people. Now, I'm the chairman of the Subcommittee on Human Resources. We just had a hearing last week. Shade Randolph. Shade Randolph. No, ma'am, I have 45 seconds. I will not yield. Shade Randolph testified in, before our committee that she was under a government program. All they did was provide benefits to her until she got under TANF. That's where she got the help to find a job. We need to help people find jobs, keep jobs, support their families and give them hope. I support this bill wholeheartedly because it gives the American people who are out of work today hope. I yield back. Gentlelady from Wisconsin. Yes, uh, we reduced welfare rolls because we literally threw people off. We did not help them find sustainable jobs, which is why poverty has increased. I'd like to yield 30 seconds to the ranking member of the committee, Mr. Peterson. Gentleman's recognized for 30 seconds. Uh, I thank the gentleman, and I strongly uh, oppose this amendment. Uh, you know, I, this amendment breaks our uh, deal that we had and is offensive in the way that it treats the uh, unemployed in this country. In short, what this proposal does, it takes money from benefits and hands it over to the states, and they can do with it what they want. It was said uh, earlier in some of the debate, with no strings attached, no accountability. You know, and it's just, this Republican Congress has been vocal in support of block grants, and I suppose that's why they're uh, uh, supporting this amendment. But I'd like to point out that it was block granting that is the very reason that we got into the LIHEAP situation and the categorical eligibility situation that we're trying to attempt in this bill. So vote no on this amendment. Yield back. Gentleman, gentlelady from uh, Wisconsin has one half minute remaining. The gentleman from Florida has 45 seconds remaining. Gentleman from Florida. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and now I yield uh, 45 seconds to the gentleman from Georgia, whose welfare rolls were reduced by over 85 percent in the 1996 work requirements. Gentleman's recognized for 45 seconds. I thank the gentleman for yielding and standing in support of the amendment. There's two very major points of it. No, one, number one is we cannot continue to deny able-bodied people the dignity of work. There seems to be a belief in the nanny state that there's something wrong with requiring able-bodied people to work. That's what this amendment does. It says to you, you know what, if you can work, you ought to be working so that other people who are unable to, they can get the needed assistance. Number two, it gives states flexibility. I trust the people in Florida. I trust the people in Wisconsin. I trust the people in Georgia and Florida and all over the country to do what's best for their state. That's what we need in America today is less centralized Washington bureaucratic planners and more state flexibility because what might work in your state might be different in mine, but this is a requirement for able-bodied people to get a job in order to receive public assistance benefits. Very common sense, and I yield back the balance of my time. General, gentlelady from Wisconsin. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. I yield the last 30 seconds to our good friend and colleague, Mr. Welch. Gentleman from Vermont is recognized for 30 seconds. I, th uh, I thank the gentlelady. This amendment is not on the level. It uses words that are important to all of us. Work. Of course people want to work. But there is no money for a work program. There is an obligation on the person who has no income, who has children, to somehow magically create their own work program. Any of the work programs have to have some support to get people to be able to move from poverty to work. This is a political statement. It's not a work program. How poor is poor? This is telling folks they're not poor enough. Grind them down and their children. One-year-old children will lose food as a result of this. I yield back. Question occurs on the amendment offered by the gentleman from 
Florida. Are those in favor say aye? aye. Those opposed, no? Opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. That's for a recorded vote. Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on this amendment by the amendment offered by the gentleman from Florida will be postponed. Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, proceedings will now resume on those amendments printed in Part B of House Report 113-117, on which further proceedings were postponed in the following order. Amendment number 99 by Mr. Goodlatte of Virginia. Amendment number 49 by Mr. Radel of Florida. Amendment number 50 by Mr. Wahlberg of Michigan. Amendment number 98 by Mr. Pitts of Pennsylvania. Amendment number 100 by Mr. Fortenberry of Nebraska. Amendment number 101 by Mr. Hulescamp of Kansas. Amendment number 102 by Mr. Sutherland of Florida. The chair will reduce to two minutes. The minimum time for an electronic vote after the first vote in this series. The unfinished business is the request for a recorded vote on amendment number 99 printed in Part B of House Report 113-117 by the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Goodlatt, on which further proceedings were postponed, on which the noes prevail by voice vote. The clerk will redesignate the amendment. Part B, amendment number 99, printed in House Report number 113-117, offered by Mr. Goodlatt of Virginia. A recorded vote has been requested. Those in support of the request for a recorded vote will rise and be counted. A sufficient number having arisen, a recorded vote is ordered. Members will record their votes by electronic device. This will be a 15-minute vote. Amendment votes continue this afternoon as lawmakers get a step closer to passage of a five-year, half-trillion-dollar farm bill. The final passage vote is expected today. There has been bipartisan opposition to plan cuts to the legislation's $20.5 billion in cuts to food stamps. So 10 votes in the series, including amendments, a procedural motion, and a vote on final passage. We could also see a vote on the journal of the previous day's work in the House. On the floor right now, members voting on Republican Robert Goodlatte of Virginia's amendment getting rid of the dairy reform proposal in the bill, replacing it with a new government-sponsored dairy insurance program. This is a 15-minute vote. As you heard, the remaining votes uh, expected to be two-minute votes. House Speaker John Boehner says that he will vote for the underlying bill. He spoke about the farm bill today during his weekly briefing. Good morning, everyone. Uh, later today, I'll be... Uh, talking uh, before the National Association of Manufacturers about America's top priority, which is jobs. Uh, right now, we're stuck with uh, slow growth, high unemployment, and stagnant wages. Uh, this cannot become the new normal. So I'll be talking about how we can help American families get ahead and how we can make America a nation of builders once again. And I hope you'll tune in at speaker.gov and follow the hashtag Nation of Builders. Another issue, uh, if Senate Democrats don't act in the next 10 days, interest rates on student loans uh, for millions of American students will double. Uh, this morning, uh, I sent a letter uh, to President Obama and asked him uh, uh, for something I thought pretty simple, some leadership. Uh, it's clear that many Senate Democrats are content to see interest rates double on college students. I think that's unacceptable. The President called for permanent market-based reforms uh, the House passed such a proposal, and now Senate Democrats are actively blocking the President's plan. Uh, listen, the President's failed to talk uh, about this issue, uh, and he hasn't lifted a finger to push his own party to pass his own proposal. So, the time uh, for games uh, is up. Uh, I think our kids deserve better, and the President and Senate Democrats need to get their act together uh, so that we can prevent, prevent these interest rates from doubling on July 1st. And finally, let me uh, be clear about one thing. America needs to secure our borders and reform our immigration laws. But immigration reform must, I mean must, uh, be grounded in real border security. And that's what the American people believe. And it's a principle that this House majority will insist upon. And I've said for weeks that uh, border security uh, in the Senate bill is not sufficient to solve the problem this week. The Congressional Budget Office agreed. It found that illegal immigration would only drop by 25 percent uh, under the Senate plan. And that, uh, I'll just tell you, that will not cut it. Now, in my view, anything as far-reaching, as complex, and as permanent as immigration reform 
uh, should not be enacted without broad bipartisan support. Uh, every day as Obamacare is being implemented, Americans are reminded of what happens when you have big legislation rammed through Congress with minimum support. Uh, Americans' confidence in their government is near an all-time low. So if immigration reform is going to work, it's essential that we have the confidence of the American people and that it's done the right way. Uh, first and foremost, that means confidence that our borders are secure, a confidence that those uh, who came here illegally are not giving a special treatment, confidence that hardworking taxpayers are being respected, and confidence that a majority of both parties uh, have had their say uh, and support the final product. With that, I'd be happy to take your questions. Speaker Banner, uh, Senators Corker and Hoban now have a proposal of border security with the hope of getting 70 Republicans in the Senate. 700 mile long fence doubling the size of the U.S. Border Patrol. Is that sufficient for you? you no, know, I've not uh, seen their proposal. I've heard that there are some discussions about it. Uh, it's, it's border security and confidence uh, that we've got the border secured uh, before we begin to go down this path of addressing both the legal immigration. <laughs> Uh, issues and the illegal immigration issues. Uh, but regardless of what the Senate does, uh, the House is going to work its will. The committees are doing their work. Uh, I've met with the Hispanic Caucus yesterday. I've talked to members on both sides of the aisle extensively about this issue. Uh, our members, uh, when we get back after July the 4th, the Republican <coughs> conference is going to have uh, uh, a special conference where there's going to be a broad discussion of this. Uh, and out of that, uh, hopefully, we'll de determine, you know, what the way forward is. Mr. Speaker, you mentioned the CBO report. Do you believe the uh, findings in that uh, report and this uh, Senate bill or the outlines of it uh, would be an economic uh, boom? Well, I haven't, uh, I haven't studied uh, the report. Matter of fact, I asked uh, uh, Chairman Paul Ryan uh, this morning uh, to, to do his own analysis of what they've done. Uh, it is kind of interesting, though, when you look at the CBO report, that uh, uh, it looks like they've used dynamic scoring, uh, something that uh, we've been urging them to do for some time. Uh, but uh, I want to get to the bottom of it uh, because it's, uh, uh, if, in fact, those numbers are anywhere close to being accurate, uh, it would be a real boom for the country. Um, Senator Graham um, has been, of course, going around talking about the political risk of not passing immigration reform because he's in a gang of eight. He said failure to pass it would mean a death spiral for the GOP in 2016. Do you think that the House GOP is sufficiently sensitive to the political risks of not getting a bill the President can sign? Listen, this is a very difficult issue. If it weren't a difficult issue, it would have been dealt with sometime over the last 15 years. It's a political football that's been kicked around and kicked around. Uh, I made it clear the day after the election. I thought it was time for Congress to deal openly and honestly with this problem. And, uh, and, and I want to deal with the problem. And so uh, people can describe it a lot of uh, different ways. Uh, I'm trying to stay focused on what do we do to make sure the problem is fixed. You've now talked about border security, which you, you avoided talking about details for some time. Are you ready to talk about whether you support a pathway for citizenship for the 11 million illegals? Good try, Jake. <laughs> So I'm not going to, uh, my job isn't to try to impose my will uh, on 434 other members. Now my job is to try to facilitate a discussion and build bipartisan support uh, for a product uh, that will address uh, this uh, broken immigration system that we have. Mr. Speaker, are you committed to, um, to convincing Chairman Goodlatte to take up the, uh, the comprehensive bill that the bipartisan group is working on? Chairman Goodlatte is entirely capable of managing his committee, and we've worked very closely with him. Uh, separate issue, Mr. Speaker. The President's expected, Thank you. <laughs> the president's expected to roll out a climate plan next week with uh, aggressive new regulations against power plants. Uh, you've been outspoken against regulations hurting health care industry. Do you have similar fears that it'll hurt? I the, think uh, this is absolutely crazy. Why would you want to increase the cost of energy and kill more American jobs at a time when the American people are still asking the question, where are the jobs? Clear enough? Paul. Um, 
you personally, you've been very invested in uh, a big deal to sort of set the whole fiscal shape of the country in a different direction. It's sort of been something that you almost have sort of staked your speakership on at various times. Where does immigration rank as a personal issue to you and how much you care about settling that issue? Well, I just think that uh, the Congress gets elected. Uh, every, the House gets elected every two years. The Senate uh, elections are every two years. Uh, the American people expect us to deal with the big problems in our country. And, uh, and I, I've frankly been committed my entire political career uh, to dealing with the issues the American people want us to deal with. And they want us to deal uh, with uh, the problem uh, of spending more than what we bring in. Fifty-five years out of the last 60, we've spent more than what we brought in. It's just not sustainable. We've got an immigration system that's broken, both the legal immigration uh, system and the problem with illegal immigration. And I might remind you that 40 percent, 40 percent of the undocumented workers uh, in our country uh, don't come from uh, south of the border. Uh, they, come, uh, they came here legally, uh, whether it was a student visa, whether it was a vacation visa, uh, and I just never quite went home. And, uh, and so we've got these problems that need to be resolved, and I'm committed to getting them resolved. I didn't come here to be speaker because I needed a fancy title in a big office. I wanted to be speaker so I could do something on behalf of the country. Yes, sir. Um, you said that the border security triggers in the Senate bill are weak. Do you believe that those triggers need to be in place before any legal status is granted to the undocumented immigrant? Well, uh, so you're, in, you're moving yourself right in the jig column, uh, trying to get me to say X or Y and draw some big line. Uh, the Congress has to have uh, the confidence of the American people if we're going to get uh, the kind of bipartisan support I think we need. And we're not going to get that confidence unless the American people look up and say, yes, uh, this border security package uh, meets the straight face test. And I'm sure it will. House Speaker Boehner earlier today. House members right now voting on amendments to the Farm Bill, hoping to wrap up work on the measure sometime this afternoon. The vote now is on a Republican amendment that would remove the dairy reform proposal replacing it with a new government-sponsored dairy insurance program. After this, we expect a series of two-minute votes on amendments, debate on a motion to recommit, followed by three more votes, including a vote on final passage. As voting continues here, immigration legislation is making its way through the Senate this month, and today senators are closer to agreement on a major item in the bill, border security. A short time ago, lawmakers rejected a border security amendment brought by Senator John Cornyn, and there could be debate on a bipartisan compromise that's making the news sometime today. You can see the Senate live as they debate immigration on C-SPAN 2. And as that debate is underway, that was one of the topics taken up this morning on Washington Journal. And now joining us here on the Washington Journal is Representative Hakeem Jeffries, a Democrat of New York and a member of the Judiciary Committee. Representative Jeffries, if we could start with where we were talking with our viewers this morning, and I don't know how much of that you heard, but we were talking about the NSA and other issues and asking if there's too much surveillance in the U.S. Well, that's a legitimate question for the American people to ask. It's a question that we in the Congress should be asking uh, of our government at the executive branch level at this point. There's got to be an appropriate balance between uh, national security interests, and certainly we live in an increasingly dangerous world. Uh, and the civil rights and civil liberties and privacy interests that we as Americans cherish. That's one of the things that make us uh, special as Americans, striking that appropriate balance. And we've got to make sure that there has not been government overreach as it relates to surveillance that is not uh, in the best interest of um, those privacy rights that we think uh, are important to, to, to us in this country. Is this an issue that's been explored at the Judiciary Committee level at all? Uh, we recently had a Judiciary Committee hearing with the outgoing FBI director uh, where several of the members, including myself, did question uh, Director Mueller on this particular issue. Uh, some of the information is classified and has to be uh, ex explored in the closed session, uh, but there are legitimate questions uh, to be raised, such as, you know, is it is, is it necessary for the NSA and for the government to acquire the phone records and the metadata of every single American over a 
fixed period of time, what was revealed is three months, uh, without any clear indication that the particular phone records are linked to individuals who may be a threat to the United States of America. Well, also in the Judiciary Committee, another issue you're looking at is the issue of immigration. Where does it stand in the House? Well, in the House, we have been uh, marking up and reviewing a series of bills that have been presented on the immigration issue with particularized topics. Uh, most recently, yesterday, uh, in the House Judiciary Committee, we marked up a bill related to farm workers uh, trying to uh, determine what was the appropriate way of filling a clear need for those who um, help with the food supply in America. Farm workers are individuals who work incredibly hard under incredibly difficult circumstances. I personally believe that we need to create a guest worker program that will provide an eventual path to citizenship while uh, filling the needs of the agricultural industry, but making sure that these workers can operate in safe uh, and in a humane environment. What do you think of the piecemeal approach that the House Judiciary Committee has taken as opposed to the Senate? Well, Peter, you know, I think it's a comprehensive approach is clearly what is appropriate at the end of the day. Uh, and my preference would be the Senate approach, where we can look at every single aspect of immigration. We've got a broken system, and almost everybody acknowledges that. Clearly, it needs to be fixed. The best way to do it uh, in the most responsible way uh, would be to undertake a comprehensive approach. Now, uh, to the credit of Chairman Goodlatte, uh, who's the chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, of course. Uh, he's indicated that the piecemeal approach is not designed uh, at the end of the day to perhaps simply address some issues and not others, but that he's come to the conclusion that a sequential approach to raising the different issues that will be important in the context of immigration reform uh, is the manner that he thinks is best at this moment. Politically, is the Senate bill achievable in the House? I think the Senate bill is absolutely achievable in the House and we've seen three instances this year where legislation that was passed in the Senate in a bipartisan way, first with the fiscal cliff agreement in early January, second with the Superstorm Sandy relief package that was passed, and then thereafter a strong bipartisan vote in connection with the reauthorization of the Violence Against Women's Act. That work product comes out of the Senate with the support of the president and the American people, lands in the House of Representatives, uh, where leadership, at least in those three instances, has made the decision to allow it for a vote. I think there will be tremendous pressure if you've got a strong bipartisan product that comes out of the Senate for us in the House to take a very close look at it, and particularly given the support of the American people, uh, for it to be given an up or down vote. Uh, Senator Grassley was talking about the immigration bill and the CBO report saying that it would reduce the deficit if passed. I want to get your response to what he had to say. What the group of eight said, that they would write a bill that would ensure that the problem doesn't have to be revisited, we find today the Congressional Budget Office thinks entirely different. I may not always agree with CBO, I disagree with the fact that CBO has used dynamic economic effects to score this bill when they don't use it on anything else, yet they refuse to provide the dynamic scoring, particularly on revenue bills. But everyone knows what the CBO says goes. Uh, and, uh, you know, I always say on the Senate floor, CBO's God. You know, they say something's going to cost something. Uh, and you want to uh, dispute what they say, you've got to have 60 votes in this body to overturn a point of order uh, against the CBO. Well, I think that the CBO report provided further evidence as to the need to pursue comprehensive immigration reform. It made clear that in the first 10 years, uh, if the Senate immigration reform bill is to be passed into law, uh, it would result in approximately $175 billion in deficit savings. And then in the second 10 years, I believe, an additional $700 billion in deficit savings. That is consequential. Now, over the first six months that I've been in the Congress, I've heard many friends on the other side of the aisle talk about 
the moral imperative of dealing with the deficit and debt crisis that we have in America. Certainly it is a significant problem. We've got to confront it. We've got to get the economy jump-started and back on track in a manner that's sustainable for the programs that we all care about. One of the ways to clearly do that, as the CBO has indicated, and this is a nonpartisan operation, is to pass comprehensive immigration reform. That provides an additional piece of evidence as to why this is so significant for us to get done uh, and to get done sooner rather than later. Congressman Jeffries, what, what's another issue before we go to calls that you focused on or that you think the Congress should be addressing? Well, I think we also have to deal with the gun violence problem that we have in America. Uh, it's a complicated issue, I understand that, but certainly uh, as Americans focused on this problem in the aftermath of the tragedy in Newtown, Connecticut, it's an issue that we confront in the district that I represent, a very urban district that has several neighborhoods, Bedford-Stuyvesant, East New York, Coney Island, Ocean Hill, Brownsville, uh, that over the last several decades have experienced significant issues r related to gun violence. Almost every weekend uh, when I'm back home, uh, there is another shooting in some part of the district that has resulted from an illegal gun that has been trafficked into Brooklyn or Queens or the city of New York that finds itself in the hands of someone who does uh, harm to an individual or a child or senior in the district that I represent. This is an issue, of course, uh, that doesn't just affect urban America, it affects suburban America, as we saw in December of last year. It affects increasingly parts of rural America. We have to deal with it, and I'm hopeful that once we get through immigration reform, the Senate uh, will, will take another look at the comprehensive background check legislation that had been proposed uh, as well as other components of, of the package to deal with the gun violence issue that we have in this country. And again, politically, do you think that's going to happen? Well, I think we've got to get through uh, comprehensive immigration reform first. That's not to say that the Senate or the House of Representatives can't multitask, but the reality is that when you've got an incredibly complex issue, both from a policy perspective that has political implications that people are thinking through on both sides of the aisle, we've got to do it in sequence. There's momentum right now for comprehensive immigration reform. I'm hopeful that we will get it done uh, in the late summer or early fall, at least uh, certainly in the Senate with an up or down vote in the House on something comprehensive. And then hopefully at that point we can turn back uh, to dealing with the gun violence issue. Well, James tweets in, comprehensive is never the way to go. The reason politicians like them so much, comprehensive bills, is that they can sneak all sorts of favors into them. Well, I certainly understand that some Americans are very cynical whenever you've got a significant bill, hundreds of pages, uh, that provides opportunities for all sorts of amendments and individual members of Congress to insert programs that may benefit their constituents. But with the, with the brokenness of the immigration system that we have and the fact that the moment in time to deal with this issue comes and goes the last time we uh, dealt with comprehensive immigration reform in a manner that resulted in legislation I believe was in 1986 with President Ronald Reagan and there are many who look back at that effort and while there were some positive things that were done uh, believe that not enough occurred to fix the broken system in a manner that has now required us to go back and take another look at it. We've got 11 million undocumented Americans who exist in this country, who are in the shadows. Many of these individuals, uh, the overwhelming majority, hardworking, family-oriented, entrepreneurial, want to be here, want to contribute uh, to America and its continued greatness moving forward. But we've got to take them out of the shadows. We can't ignore this problem. I think people on both sides of the aisle recognize that you can't ignore 11 million undocumented Americans living uh, in this country, and that's why comprehensive immigration reform is important. Our guest is Congressman Hakeem Jeffries, a Democrat of New York. He's a member of the Judiciary Committee as well as the Budget Committee. He spent six years in the New York State Assembly. Uh, he's a lawyer, got his law degree at New York University School of Law after getting a master's at Georgetown and a bachelor's at SUNY Binghamton. 
and clerked with Judge Harold Baer of the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of New York. Did you get to know Judge Sotomayor when she was up there at that point? Uh, I did not get to know Judge Sotomayor well, although I have uh, been present at several uh, speaking engagements that she's had over the years, beginning when she was first appointed uh, to the district court, and then of course she was elevated to the to the circuit court. She's a phenomenal justice. Of course, there's some important some important issues right now before the Supreme Court of, of of the United States, and we'll see how things turn out over the next couple of weeks. He's just been elected to his first term in 2012. We put several issues out on the table. If you'd like to participate in our conversation, the numbers are also on the screen. Martha in Chillicothe, Ohio, is a Democrat. You're first up, Martha. Please go ahead. Uh, hello. Yes, um, I'd like to speak a little bit this morning uh, about um, the um, Bush administration. They, uh, I, I think they're still trying to run uh, uh, Bush's uh, world order. Where is, where is his world order standing right now? Why Martha, is, what, do you, what do you mean by that? Could you give a little more definition? Well, when he gets up there, you know, and speaks, and he says, I'm going to have a new world order. And now he, he's still trying to run the United States and the world. And there's no, nothing being passed in the Congress or the Senate. And it just seems like it's going their way. But they're all in cahoots together with the Koch brothers investing in the United States. National Geographic will give you the story of the Koch brothers, and it's it's forming a communist nation is what it's all about. And, and they, that's they don't Martha like in Chillicothe, Ohio. Representative Jeffries, anything you'd like to say to Martha? Well, I think there clearly were some implications of the Bush presidency that President Obama is currently dealing with. He's gotten us out of Iraq. He promised that he would do it. He's executed uh, upon that commitment. Uh, we're, we're heading out of Afghanistan uh, by 2014. That's another important step forward. Clearly, uh, President Obama inherited a more dangerous world. There's some things that have to be done to deal with the threat of global terrorism uh, that will call in, into question our ability uh, to provide the same level of freedoms uh, that we've come to expect in America. Things obviously changed when the towers collapsed uh, and those two planes struck us in New York City. But uh, we still have to... 291, the nays are 135 with one member voting present. The amendment is not adop adopted. Excuse me. The unfinished business is a request for a court vote on amendment number 49 printed in Part B of House Report 113-117 by the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Rattle, on which further proceedings were postponed and on which the notes prevailed by a voice vote. Vote the clerk will redesignate the amendment. Part B, Amendment Number 49, printed in House Report Number 113-117, offered by Mr. Radel of Florida. A recorded vote has been requested. Those in support of the request for a recorded vote will rise and be counted. Sufficient number having arisen. A recorded vote is ordered. Members will record their votes by electronic device. This will be a two-minute vote. So Farm Bill Amendment votes continue this afternoon. Members now voting on an amendment that would repeal the National Sheep Industry Improvement Center. Two-minute votes now.
Mr. Nunnally. Off no on I for Mr. Nunnally. Ms. Fudge. Off no on I for Ms. Fudge. Mrs. Beatty. Off no on I for Mrs. Beatty. Ms. Waters. Off no on I for Ms. Waters. Mr. Lynch. Off no on I for Mr. Lynch. Ms. Eddie Bernice Johnson. Off no on I for Ms. Eddie Bernice Johnson. Mr. Al Green. Off no on I for Mr. Al Green. Both the ayes are 235, the nays are 192, majority voting in the affirmative. The amendment is adopted. The unfinished business is a request for a court vote on amendment number 50, printed in Part B of House Report 113-117, by the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Wahlberg, on which further proceedings were postponed, on which the noes prevailed by voice first vote. The clerk will redesignate the amendment. Part B, amendment number 50, printed in House Report number 113-117, offered by Mr. Wahlberg of Michigan. A recorded vote has been requested. Those who support the request for a recorded vote will rise and be counted. A sufficient number having arisen. A recorded vote is ordered. Members will record their votes by electronic device. This will be a two-minute vote. And now the third of ten remaining votes this afternoon, a two-minute vote on the amendment brought by Republican Congressman Tim Wahlberg of Michigan that would remove natural stone from the list of products that can, pe that can petition the Agriculture Department for a research order.
Both the ayes are 215, the nays are 211. Majority voting in the affirmative. The amendment is adopted. The unfinished business is a request for a recorded vote on amendment number 98, printed in Part B of House Report 113-117 by the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Pitts, on which further proceedings were postponed and on which the noes prevail by a voice vote. The clerk will redesignate the amendment. Part B, amendment number 98, printed in House Report number 113-117, offered by Mr. Pitts of Pennsylvania. A recorded vote has been requested. Those in support of the request for a recorded vote will rise and be counted. A sufficient number having arisen. A recorded vote is ordered. Members record their votes by electronic device. This will be a two-minute vote. So another two-minute vote. This amendment offered by Congressman Joe Pitts of Pennsylvania, supporting the existing sugar program with some changes. House Speaker John Boehner gave his weekly briefing earlier today, and we showed it to you a short time ago. Now, he will also be delivering keynote, uh, keynote remarks at the National Association of Manufacturers Annual Summit. He'll address the economy, job creation in the manufacturing industry. He'll be introduced by the president and CEO, Jay Timmons, and that is live starting in just a couple of minutes, about 1.15 Eastern. You'll be able to see it on our website, cspan.org. Also, House Democratic Leader Nancy Pelosi will be briefing reporters today. Her weekly legislative press conference expected to start at about 2 p.m. Eastern. We do expect her to address the farm policies and nutrition programs in the farm bill that the House is debating and voting on today. That's expected again to start at 2 p.m. Eastern. You'll be able to see that live online at cspan.org. vote. The ayes are 206, the nays are 221, less than majority voting in the affirmative. The amendment is not adopted. The unfinished business is a request for a recorded vote on amendment number 100, printed in Part B of House Report 113-117, by the gentleman from Nebraska, Mr. Fortenberry, on which further proceedings were postponed and on which the noes prevail by voice vote. Clerk will redesignate the amendment. Part B, Amendment Number 100, printed in House Report Number 113-117, offered by Mr. Fortenberry of Nebraska. A recorded vote has been requested. Those in support of the request for a recorded vote will rise and be counted. A sufficient number having arisen, a recorded vote is ordered. Members record their votes by electronic device. This will be a two-minute vote. Ten votes happening this afternoon in the House. A two-minute vote now on the amendment brought by Congressman Fortenberry of Nebraska. His amendment would lower farm program payment limits and cap commodity payments.
The ayes are 230, the nays are 194, a majority voting in the affirmative. The amendment is adopted. The unfinished business is a request for a recorded vote on amendment number 101, printed in Part B of House Report 113-117 by the gentleman from Kansas, Mr. Hulescamp, on which further proceedings were postponed and on which the noes prevailed by a voice vote. Clerk will redesignate the amendment. Part B, amendment number 101, printed in House Report number 113-117, offered by Mr. Hulescamp of Kansas. Recorded vote has been requested. Those in support of the request for a recorded vote will rise and remain standing until counted. Sufficient number having arisen, a recorded vote is ordered. Members will record their votes by electronic device. This will be a two-minute vote. So two amendments remain in this series of farm bill votes. This is another amendment dealing with the SNAP program, the food stamp program bill, brought by Congressman Tim Hulskamp. It would call for further work requirements from SNAP recipients. Apparently about one in seven Americans use the food stamp uh, program, su food stamp subsidies, to feed their families, but the cost of the program has apparently doubled over the last five years to nearly $80 billion. So one more amendment and then a possible motion to recommit after this and a vote on final passage and a possible vote on the journal. That would wrap up voting in the House for the week. Is 175, the nays are 250, less than the majority voting in the affirmative. The amendment is not adopted. The unfinished business is a request for a court vote on amendment number 102, printed in Part B of House Report 113-117 by the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Sutherland, on which further proceedings were postponed and on which the ayes prevail by voice vote. Clerk will redesignate the amendment. Part B, amendment number 102, printed in House Report number 113-117, offered by Mr. Sutherland of Florida. A recorded vote has been requested. Those in support of the request for a recorded vote will rise and be counted. Sufficient number having arisen. A recorded vote is ordered. Members record their votes by electronic device. This will be a two-minute vote. The final amendment vote is on the Sutherland Amendment, very similar to the previous amendment dealing with SNAP recipients. This would allow states to create work requirements for those getting food stamps. The bill itself, the underlying bill, would cut about $4 billion a year in overall spending for farm and nutrition programs. It expands crop insurance programs and creates a new kind of crop insurance that takes effect before farmers' paid policies do. House Speaker John Boehner has said that he will vote for the bill.
With the ayes are 227, the nays are 198, a majority voting in the affirmative. The amendment is adopted. The question is on, the, question is on the amendment and the nature of a substitute as amended. Those in favor, please say aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it. The amendment is adopted accordingly. Under the rules, the committee rises. The chair of the committee of the whole house on the state of the union reports that the committee has had under consideration the bill H.R. 1947 and pursuant to house resolution 271 reports the bill back to the house with an amendment adopted in the committee of the whole. Under the rule the previous question is ordered is a separate vote demanded on any amendment to the amendment reported from the Committee of the Whole. If not, the question is on adoption of the amendment in the nature of a substitute, as amended. Those in favor will say aye. Those opposed will say no. The ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. The question is on engrossment and third reading of the bill. Those in favor will say aye. Those opposed will say no. The ayes have it. Third reading. A bill to provide for the reform and continuation of agricultural and other programs of the Department of Agriculture through fiscal year 2018 and for other purposes. For what purposes a gentlewoman from California seek recognition? Uh, Mr. Speaker, I have a motion to recommit at the desk. Is the gentlewoman opposed to the bill? I am opposed in its current form. The gentlewoman qualifies. The clerk will report the motion. Ms. Brownlee of California moves to recommit the bill, H.R. 1947, to the Committee on Agriculture with instructions to report the same back to the House forthwith with the following amendment. Page 496, after line 14, add the following. Section 8408 protecting homeowners from the devastating effects of wildfires in the wildland urban interface. The Act of June 4, 19, 1897, 30-11, is amended by adding at the end of the second full paragraph at 30 set 35, 16 U.S.C. 551, the following new sentence, to ensure that there are su su 